when a young Mennonite woman was found in Arizona. Okay, has it done? He has it? He has it. Let's go. The police were desperate to discover why someone would take her several hours away from her home in New Mexico, only to sh her dead and dump her body. Go, go, go. Sheriff's office, get out of the car! Get out of the car! Turn off the car! Step out now! Little did they know that as they worked with the Mennonite community to solve this terrible crime, authorities would end up discovering a decade's worth of unsolved crimes, all leading back to one depraved man. Get your hands up! Step away from the car! On February 22nd, 2020, no Cynthia Schultz video, was pleasantly sir. spending her morning collecting firewood for her camp at the Sunset Crater National Park, around 20 miles from Flagstaff, Arizona. While out, Cynthia spotted a woman lying face down in the dirt. Thinking something might be wrong, she called out to the woman. However, when she didn't respond, Cynthia had a horrifying revelation. The woman was dead. Cynthia alerted the authorities and soon the area was swarmed with police trying to get to the bottom of this tragedy. He didn't move or nothing. He just went and looked, checked her and... Okay. Rigid is a, a rigor mortis. She was real stiff, cold. Oh. It was immediately clear to the detectives that this case was a homicide as the victim had a shot wound to the head and her hands were bound together with duct tape. As they inspected the body closer they noticed that the victim was wearing very modest and traditional clothes, which made them suspect she might be a Mennonite. What? Mennonites are a Christian denomination that practice a conservative lifestyle, dedicating themselves to their religion and only using technology that's strictly necessary, such as basic phones. Through forensic what? comparisons, the police were able to identify the mysterious victim as 27-year-old Sasha Kraus, a Mennonite woman who had gone missing from New Mexico on January 18th, over a month before she was discovered. While police may have finally been able to give their victim a name, it was now time to uncover her horrific story and find out the truth about how she ended up murdered in a national park nearly 300 miles from her home. Wow. Through interviews and investigation, the police were able to determine that Sasha was a Sunday school teacher who had worked and lived on the Lamp and Light compound, a Mennonite community in Farmington, New Mexico. On the night of her disappearance, Sasha was making a quick late night stop by the Sunday school to finish an errand. When she failed to come home that night, Sasha's roommates alerted the community and the police were soon involved. Shit is making my Unfortunately, balls, the case had hit a dead end fairly soon after beginning, and it seemed like Sasha had simply vanished into thin air. However, not only did authorities now have Sasha's body, they were also able to recover her phone, a key piece of evidence that could likely point them in the direction of their killer. Through phone records, the police were able to deduce that Sasha hadn't just vanished. She'd been kidnapped. As her kidnapper drove her to Arizona, Sasha's phone could be seen pinging off of select phone towers before it died. Throughout her entire trip to Arizona, there was only one other device pinging off of those same towers, and it belonged to a man named Mark Gooch. Mark Gooch was an air- Mark Gooch. <laughs> Mark <laughs> Mark Gooch. Man ...working at Luke Air Force Base in Arizona and at first glance it appeared he had nothing in common with Sasha outside of his cell phone records. Nevertheless, Lauren Nagel, the lead detective on the case, traveled to Luke Air Force Base and sat down with Mark for questioning. Detective Nagel introduces herself as Detective Jones as she got married at some point between this interview and her appearance in court. Hi, thank you for your patience. That would work out that way. I ask you to come talk with me and then, um, obviously, a phone call, right? All right, so I'm Detective Jones. I'm with the Sheriff's Office. Um, I'm sure you're wondering what I want to chat with you about yeah. before some of us fill you in. We just got to go through some procedural stuff first. The interview takes place in an interrogation room on Luke Air Force Base and is an ideal setup according to the Reed Technique, a popular method of interrogation. There's no barrier between Detective Nagel and Mark allowing her to observe all of his movements and nonverbal communication. The walls appear to be bare, which is intentional to minimize distractions. 
It's also helpful that there's only one detective present, which can make the interview feel less threatening. Additionally, Mark is seated near the door, which helps send the message that he's able to leave at any time. This may make him less defensive and more likely to talk. It can also help prevent any false imprisonment claims later. Detective Nagel and Mark speak briefly about his responsibilities as a mechanic in the Air Force before the detective asks about Mark's life back home. So what did you do before Air Force then? I worked in the diesel mechanic shop for about a year and uh, did construction as well hmm. and grew up on for dairy farms. So. Oh yeah? That's pretty cool. Do you have siblings? Yes, ma'am. Six. <laughs> oh wow, really? Yep. Okay, big family. Yeah. Tell me about them. Like, how many brothers, sisters? Uh, three brothers. How many brothers, sisters, sisters y'all got? Okay. Got it. And where are they at now? All over the country. All over? Yes, ma'am. Are you the youngest? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Who would you say you're closest with? I don't know. We kind of got separated One pretty each. good after they uh, started moving out. So you're not close with any of them? Yeah. I talked to them on the phone here and there, but well, I'm probably closest. I don't know. Me and my brother back in Wisconsin. Oh, gosh. Gotcha. Which brother's that? It's Sam. Sam. Okay. Mark comes across as a polite, well-mannered airman, but as we'll see over the course of the interview, this is just a facade. So what do you do on your time off? Nonsense. Um, I have... Play on my computer sometimes, mm -hmm. play some games, you go hiking as much as possible, but work on my car and bike a lot too. Mm -hmm. try, to stay, try to stay active. Cool. Do you like go to church or anything like that? Uh, no, man. Church closed down. Oh, that's close to? Coronavirus. Got you. Is that something that you did before it closed? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. I would attend church quite a bit. Okay. If you don't mind me asking about that, what kind of religion did you grow up in? Uh, we grew up in a Christian, uh, Christian, I guess the relig religion, I guess is how you call it, but Christianity is how I was raised. Oh, okay. Any, like, specific denomination of Christianity? Uh, mainly, they were called Mennonites, um, or Amish, I'm not sure how oh. familiar are with that. Not really. Tell me about that. But basically, oh, yeah, we're playing Garctic Phone tonight too with DEO artists. Drive dark colored vehicles. Uh, we use flip phones when you have internet stuff like that. So it was pretty. It was pretty uh, sheltered. You could pretty sheltered. Difficult. I got it. With this admission, the police now have another unexpected link between Mark and Sasha. They're both Mennonites. When the detective brings up the topic of religion. Mark starts to fumble with his words, Mark indicating that the topic of religion may be something Mark doesn't want to talk about. In that last six months, have you traveled out of state anywhere? Yes, ma'am. When I came down here, I drove my car from Wisconsin down here. Oh, okay. So you drove from Wisconsin to Phoenix? Correct. Anywhere else? Uh, pretty much all. State of Arizona. I try, mm -hmm. to, try to do as much hiking as possible. Mark doesn't know it yet, but he's just been caught in his first lie, the first of many. Using words like pretty much, mostly, and similar sentiments are qualifiers and often throw up a red flag to detectives. These words usually indicate half-truths or that there is something the individual may not wish to disclose. In this case, Mark saying that he pretty much stays in Arizona isn't true at all, and he's hiding something very big. He also uses filler sounds such as uh to delay answering so he has time to think about his response. You're pro again, you're probably wondering, you know, why I'm here. So I'm a detective. I'm with Coconino County Sheriff's Office. Okay. And I am working a homicide investigation. Okay. Um, this, there was a girl named Sasha Krause that was killed. Did you hear about that case? I seen it in the news. Yes, ma'am. Tell me, tell me what you know about the case. Uh, it's basically the news report. She was from... New Mexico, right? Mm hmm And she left home. I left home one evening and they found her in northern Arizona, like Flagstaff area, correct? Right, right. So that's the case that I'm working. Any idea now why I'd want to talk to you at all? Probably because I was probably traveling up in New Mexico area, probably. Yeah, yeah that's exactly it. As the detective reveals why she's here interviewing him, Got Mark him. begins to show more and more signs that he may be hiding something. When asked what he knows about Sasha Krause's murder, Mark vaguely says that they found her. Mm. This is a soft way to describe something as violent as a homicide. And they found her in northern Arizona. 
When suspects shy away from using realistic words such as murdered or killed, this can be a red flag for possible deception as they're minimizing the crime. Additionally, Mark uses the qualifier probably three times in eight seconds. Probably because I was probably traveling up in New Mexico area, probably. So we've got these things called license plate readers. Okay. And your vehicle hit a license plate reader in that in that area. Mm. So tell me tell me about that. You were traveling then you I'm a little confused because at first you said you, you hadn't traveled but now did you go to New Mexico? Yes ma'am. Your vehicle was picked up on that license plate reader in the general area um, uh, on the same day actually that she went missing. And so what I'm doing at this point is I gotta talk to everybody, as you can imagine, that's my job. Anybody who's in the area, anybody who could have seen something. Despite the fact that Mark appears to be intentionally lying, Detective Nagel does a great job of calling him out for it while also remaining non-judgmental. She does this in order to keep Mark from feeling threatened and ending the interview, while also not letting him get comfortable in any of the lies he tells. The more someone repeats a lie, the more confident they will become. That is true. She also keeps him calm by not telling him the whole truth about why she's there. Although she's telling Mark that she's just interviewing everyone who got picked up on a certain license mm -hmm. plate reader, we know that Mark is actually her number one suspect, and that he was found through phone records. This is just one example of the ways detectives can lie during interviews in order to get a suspect to tell them the truth. So why were you in New Mexico that day? I was planning on going, so I was checking out many churches. I had traveled up to Flagstaff. Mark takes a big pause after he says he traveled, followed by his foot twitching, and then he says to Flagstaff. I had traveled up to Flagstaff. This is something called a cadence yeah, switch, country, which I'm is essentially a disruption in the flow and inflection of speech. In an interrogation, this can be seen as an indication of something being left out of a story as the speaker paused and changed their speech pattern. I was hoping that ski resort was still open. Yeah. They were closed due to coronavirus starting up. Mm -hmm. And um, so I figured I'd go check out a midnight church up in that area. So I knew some people from Wisconsin that used to live there. Mm -hmm. And Dumb. I wanted to go just attend his met because I've really been missing that social life. Yeah. I used to have my night churches. Is there any reason why you didn't tell me when I asked you if you've traveled, you didn't mention that to me? Is there a reason that you didn't? No, no, I'm sorry. My memory just, I don't know, it's not what it used to be. I'm tired today. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I failed to mention that, but I okay. was not trying to hide or withhold information. Okay, thanks. Once again, Mark is caught in a lie. While explaining why he was in New Mexico, he mentions that he was wanting to go skiing. However, the ski resort he drove to, the Arizona Snow Bowl Ski Resort in Flagstaff, was closed due to COVID-19 restrictions. In actuality, the Snow Bowl didn't close for COVID until March, Damn. well after Mark would have been there on January 18th. As he says this, he half shrugs with his right shoulder. It's barely perceptible, but lines up when he says, I don't know. Internally, he does know, and is just making excuses, but he's not confident in his memory excuse. Mark is also sitting with his leg crossed in a way that creates a barrier between himself and the detective. He switched to this guarded position after he was asked about traveling. When questioned about why he didn't mention this trip earlier, Mark's military formality helps him appear more truthful than he's actually being. He refers to Detective Nagel as ma'am and immediately apologizes for not mentioning the trip because he was tired. Unfortunately for Mark, no matter how polite he is, this omission is definitely a sign that he has a reason to keep this trip a secret, and the detective has certainly picked up on that. Do you, do you remember that day then when you went to New Mexico? Um, shoot, but, so... Yeah, yeah, okay. I think I remember some of it. So what time about did you leave here to look Air Force Base? Yeah, save y'all goots. Uh, probably left fairly early in the morning. Okay. And then what time did you say I was in the area? I, I don't, I have to go grab my, I've got like the charts, the paper. Oh, okay. What? Girls don't have gooches. What time, well, let's, again, let's go through the day. So when you say fairly early, what does that mean to you? I uh, probably about seven. Okay. Seven is when I left to head up there. Mm -hmm. Stopped in Flagstaff for a while. Just got some, uh, just stopped, got some fuel, I believe. 
This is one of the last fully truthful statements Mark says while recounting his trip to New Mexico. While he may think he's being sneaky with his lies, Detective Nagel knows a lot more than she's letting on mm. and is ready to catch every lie Mark throws her way. <laughs> and did you go anywhere else while you were in Flagstaff? <laughs> no, no, not on the way up. Uh, yeah, pretty much straight driving. Had a really pretty snow capped mountain up there. Yeah. At that time. So you stopped in Flagstaff, you got gas, and then you think that you drove directly to the church in Farmington? I stopped in Farmington uh, to get some fuel. Watch how the detective suddenly starts kicking her foot. Since this discussion is about the scene of the crime, she likely feels a lot of pressure with these questions, trying to make sure she gets his story and also has what she needs to confront him later. With all of his deceptive behavior already, she's likely fairly certain that he is the person she's looking for. And these are really the high stakes questions. About two o'clock in the afternoon, I had stopped by the, I had swung by the church to check their sign and see what mm -hmm. time of services was. And they were, let me think, I think it was just Sunday and Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. At this point in the investigation, Detective Nagel has spent a lot of time at Sasha's church looking for any sign of what happened to her on January 18th. In her entire time there, the detective has never seen any sign even somewhat similar to the one Mark is claiming to have checked. Did you, like, talk to anybody while you were there? No. No, the, there was no one at the church, and I didn't want to bother anybody. So. Did you so, like it? I don't know. What, what, is it a church that, like, 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 like what you grew up in or different? It looks fairly similar, but it's, just, it's not really the same, so I was just I'm a little disappointed with the whole whole long drive and everything I didn't really see is working out long term to make it there. Yeah, that is long drive. It'd be way too far to drive every weekend. So I, so I got, I uh, talked to my friend, he wanted to go hiking uh, on Sunday and I really wanted to make it for that. Uh, I work with him in the shop. And so, well, who's that friend? Uh, his name's Kefley. Mark claims that he made plans with Kefley to go hiking the following day. However, according to Kepfley himself, the two actually went to a swap meet, also known as a flea market. From what I'm understanding, it doesn't sound like you were there for very long. No, no. And then did, where did you go after that? Yo, what the fuck? I never heard a flea market be called a swap meet, and I said, every time I expect some shit like this, like where the place will be and where it will happen, it's always in the middle of fucking nowhere. Like, I've never heard of Flagstaff, Arizona. Shit is ass. Where the fuck is that? Like, I know now, but what the fuck? I was going to go look for a hike, or was I, did I head straight back? I think I started, once he called me about the hike on Sunday, I think I started heading back. He called you? Correct. While you were over there? Correct. Okay. According to Mark, Kepley called him to discuss plans. However, the phone records disagree with Mark. Mark and Kepley only texted that day. And in fact, the only person that Mark spoke to on the phone was his brother, Sam. Not only did Mark and Sam, Sam call, Gooch. but they actually called each other six <laughs> times for a total Yo. of nearly two and a half hours, which is longer than the two had talked on the phone for the last six months combined. On the way back home, did you stop anywhere? I don't know, I might have made it to Phoenix. And for yeah. the first time, we see him change his reaction and become stern. He oh, clearly shit. doesn't like that his brother is also being interviewed. Perhaps Mark has good reason to fear that Sam will say too much to the cops, as while Sam refused to answer the majority of questions during his brief interview, Man, he did say one thing family. that caught detectives' attention. Not only did Sam claim that Mark had a grudge against Mennonites, but when asked if he knew why the cops were questioning him, Sam ominously replied no, but that he knew his brother and how he is, giving police even more reason to be suspicious of Mark. Mm. With his interview concluded, Mark was served several search warrants yeah, for his phone, up. apartment, and car, all of which proved to be very enlightening to the authorities. The first thing investigators noticed when looking at Mark's car was how spotless it was. Upon further inspection, they were able to recover a receipt that showed Mark had gotten his car heavily detailed on February 23rd, the day after it was announced to the public that Sasha's body had been found. Additionally, the police also discovered some black nitro gloves in the car, 
alongside some suspicious stains. Now that detectives are finally able to scour Mark's phone, more inconsistencies hey. begin to pop up. According to his deletion records, Mark had deleted several files and documents from his Google account early in the morning of January 19th, after returning home from his New Mexico trip. He also deleted several texts with Sam, where he discussed getting his car detailed, stating that he wanted the detailers to clean the interior really well. With several concerning, if somewhat circumstantial, things found in Mark's phone and car, they had enough to detain him. However, police still didn't have enough evidence to actually connect Mark to Sasha's killing, never mind justify an arrest and guarantee a conviction. There was still the puzzling question of why, as there was no clear motive why Mark would have killed Sasha. Investigators soon began interviewing and interrogating the people closest to him in the hopes that they could shed some light on the case. First, they started with Alex Golub, Mark's good friend from basic training. For the most part, Alex said that Mark seemed completely normal throughout their friendship. However, there was one odd moment Alex mentioned that really stuck out to detectives. Has Mark ever talked about killing people to you? No, ma'am. Uh, just the text that we, we did have. Um, we were going to go spec ops together, and we were kind of looking at Tacky. Mm -hmm. uh, and he mentioned in one of the texts that um, something like it would, he'd be happy to get paid for killing yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. But I was just like, oh, I mean, that's a kind of like a huge thing. It's just a weird thing to say. So I was like, oh, that's just huge. And also, you know, it's, it's the enemy. So, I mean, I'm not, I don't really take it as like, He's wanting to kill innocents. It's more like the enemy. Okay. These are exactly what you're referring to, probably. See that the highlighted conversation between you guys? Yes, ma'am. Is that what you you were just talking about? Let's go tag B together. Yes, ma'am. Do you have the one uh, where it says he... Yes, yes. Where it says, I would like to get paid to kill people. Right. And I don't have the next page, but um, from what I recall of that conversation, you guys, you, like, you didn't say, whoa, man, that's weird. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you guys kind of just went on. I think I just typed his name in all caps, because that's what I, I, Good. I would always say. Okay. If he said something just, like, strange. While Alex laughed off Mark's comment, there's no denying that it's concerning. This text from Mark implies that he may have been harboring these sorts of morbid Gooch, desires. dude, you're so silly, Gooch. <laughs> long before targeting Sasha. It was all, it was about respect, too. Really, Gooch? Like, one guy in our sister class, he had his feet up on the desk one day, and uh, Gooch was like, oh, you should probably get your, you know, get your feet off the desk. Mm -hmm. And the, the other dude made, you know, a snarky comment, like, oh, you're telling me what to do kind of thing now. Yeah. And I could tell that Gooch got pretty, pretty mad at that. And I was like, oh, like calm down. Okay. From Alex's story about Mark, we can see some indications that Mark may struggle with anger control. The story is also indicative of excessive rigidity. People who are very rigid when it comes to social rules may often get into confrontations with others because they can't cope with seeing any rule-breaking behaviors they deem inappropriate. While this might seem contradictory at first, given the accusations against Mark, he may feel that the rules don't apply to him. This is a trait typically found in he individuals like with antisocial personality disorder. How do you remember Mark reacting to stress? Just stiff as a board, very, uh, very disciplined, never, you know, never screamed back, never mm -hmm. lost his cool kind of thing. Okay. Uh, you'd see, like, you'd see his face get red, but I thought he was just embarrassed. Alex describes Mark as stiff as a board and mentions his face turning red. These traits, in conjunction with how we saw Mark acting during his interview, could be signs that he's emotionally cut off. This is another trait that's common among individuals with antisocial personality disorder and is tied to their overall lack of empathy. Mm. While these few indicators certainly aren't enough to give Mark a full diagnosis, they can give us some insight into how he might think. Like a retard. As investigators question those around Mark, they learn something very interesting that could blow this case wide open. According to Kemper Kepley, Mark's best friend at Luke Air Force Base, Mark had secretly kept a gun on base for several months. However, he'd recently given the gun to another friend to store off base. Detectives were quick to track this gun down and bring it in for testing which showed that it was the same caliber as the bullet that killed Sasha. However, while the police were in possession of Mark's gun, 
the case took a turn none of the investigators were expecting. I got a text just a few minutes ago from Sam Gooch that said, Mark Gooch had said that I could help him out with his possessions. The detective is fine with Kemper working with Sam to get yeah, some of Mark's belongings. However, he does have one request. He starts asking about the gun. That's what we want to know about. Right. And, okay. Uh, and don't, like, provide him any information that you know about the gun. He can help, he can help that. So we're asking, we're asking you not to do that. Within a week of this call with Kemper, detectives were notified that Sam had reached out to Jeremiah Levesque the last person who had Mark's gun These names aren't before it was given to the police. While working with Jeremiah, the police listened in on a phone call between him and Sam, where Sam made plans to travel across state lines to Arizona in order to dispose of Mark's gun before the police could get it. In the call, Sam told Jeremiah, Considering what's going on, if you're comfortable, I would say get rid of the gun any way you deem Gucci fit. Main. Um, if not, I will deal with it whenever I get there. <laughs> Jeremiah was then able to arrange a meetup point with Sam where they planned to trade Mark's gun. However, unbeknownst to Sam, Jeremiah had been given a replica gun by the police, and officers were going to be covertly hidden around the meetup site, waiting to make their arrest. Target just pulled into the second parking spot. Yeah, no problem. Here you go, sir. Hey, call it in. I can't. My phone. Where's your phone? Target's getting back in his car. He's got the gun. Target has a gun. He has it? He has it. Let's go. Step out now! Get your hands up! Step away from the car! Step towards me! Turn away from me now! Get on your knees! Get on your knees! Put your hands behind your head! Passenger, get out of the car! Passenger, in the back, get out of the car! With their sting operation successful and Sam Gooch arrested, it was time for the detectives to find out why Sam was so set on disposing of Mark's gun. Yeah. Detective Troy Short was sent in to interrogate Sam, and he was immediately met with resistance. You want to start from the beginning and kind of... Thank you. I, I believe you think I know more than I do. And uh, so explain what that means. You know what I mean? What, if I know more than you do, help me understand that. I don't think this is going to be a proper conversation for me. Well, Sam and I... Do you, want to, do you want to tell me about tonight? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you want to tell me why you guys came halfway across the country to pick up a gun? Yes, no, sir. Okay. Do you understand why you're here in the room? Yes, sir. Here's the deal, Sam. I, a part of me even feels bad right now because, like I told you back in Wisconsin, you weren't a focus. You weren't a suspect. Mm -hmm. And now, because of some bad choices, you're in some serious trouble. Not as serious as Mark, by any means. You know what I mean? He's in some serious, serious trouble, and I tried to explain that to you back there. Is there anything you can do to help yourself right now, or help yourself out of this mess, or? As much as I would like to, I frankly do not believe you have my best interest in mind. Okay. And I do not think discussing this with you would be helpful. While Sam may be refusing to give the detective the guy. answers he's looking for, he has yet to actually invoke his Miranda rights. Whether or not Sam knows this, refusing to answer nigga. a line Fuck of questioning is not enough to stop name. an interrogation <laughs> and get a lawyer. Them. We can see that Sam is being very cautious in how he responds to Detective Short. When he pauses to take a sip of water after being asked a question, it's likely that he was doing this as a stalling tactic to allow himself time to carefully pick his words. Sam appears to have some prior knowledge about interrogations, as he is correct that the detective doesn't have the suspect's best interests in mind. He appears reluctant to speak as he likely doesn't want to incriminate himself or his brother further by saying the wrong thing. Why did he call you for this extensive period of time on that specific day, specifically the day that he's under arrest for murder? You know what I mean? 
extensive amount of phone calls that day for elaborate amount of time, completely outside the norm of you guys' normal communication process. Why are you in Arizona? Why did you fly halfway across the country? Why did you obtain a new phone with a new phone number to do this? Why are you here picking up a gun that you know belongs to Mark? If you don't know what he did, then why would you do that? You know what he allegedly did. Okay, I understand that. So you know he allegedly murdered somebody. Correct. Okay, so why are you picking up a gun that belonged to him? Specifically, when I told you, when I interviewed you back in Wisconsin, do you know Mark has any guns? And you're like, nope. I don't think he's allowed to have one base. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. So what's the deal? I would like to collect all of Mark's possessions as possible. If that gun is his possession, I would like to collect that as well. Sam refuses to tell the detective why he tried to dispose of Mark's gun, but there are a few possible explanations. Mark claimed that Sam was his closest brother. It's possible that he called Sam and used their close relationship to convince Sam he had to get rid of the gun. Not because Mark killed someone, but because police thought he did. It's more than evident that Sam has a distrust of law enforcement, so it would make sense for Mark to prey upon this feeling in order to persuade his brother that if Sam yeah, didn't dispose of this, this weapon, the police were going to frame Mark for something he didn't do. It's attempted destruction of evidence, attempted tampering with evidence, attempted hindering prosecution. I mean, there's two felonies in there. Like, this is a big deal. So do you want to help me understand it? Do you want to explain it to me? Do you want to... I don't think so. What is the next in this process? Brothers. The next part is you go down to jail. Okay. Damn. Well, the way I see it, talking and discussing this with you, we will only use it against me to make these charges stick. Um, and to further incriminate Mark. Since Sam clearly understands how his words could be used against him, it's odd that he's still agreeing to sit here rather than asking for an attorney or outright refusing to respond. It's possible that his curiosity got the better of him and he wants to find out how much the detectives know about Mark's crime. It's also possible that Sam is afraid and feels that if he at least agrees to sit in the interrogation room, he may be able to dodge the consequences of having helped Mark. With Sam's interview at a stalemate, the detectives are forced to look elsewhere for information. Throughout their entire investigation, the one thing they haven't been able to deduce clearly is motive. Was this just a random killing? Or was there something more at play here? While it's clear that Mark had some sort of grudge against Mennonites, it made no sense that someone with no prior criminal history would suddenly plan an elaborate murder six hours away from their home and target someone they'd never even heard of before. At least that's what Detective Nagel thought until she spoke with some Mennonites from Wisconsin and discovered that Mark's past wasn't quite as clean as it seemed. In a phone interview with Mark's really former Jack, pastor, James respect, Luke Martin, man. Detective Nagel learned that no one at Mark's former church was surprised to learn that he'd now been arrested in connection with such a heinous crime, as Mark had a reputation for taking revenge on others. Mark had also allegedly been involved in several robberies at the church. Damn. When the church tried to punish him for his involvement, his parents stepped in and decided to leave the church for being too critical of Mark. However, this was not the end of Mark's criminal activities. While living with his sister in Pennsylvania, Mark was accused of stealing money from the local Mennonites. Soon after, everyone who accused Mark of stealing money discovered that their car suspiciously stopped working. After investigating further, these Mennonites found that sand had been placed into the oil pans of their cars, causing their engines to stop working. While those affected weren't able to prove it was Mark who put the sand there, it doesn't seem like a coincidence given his interest in mechanics and apparent taste for revenge. Detective Nagel then spoke to Jonathan Martin, the son of Mark's pastor, who provided further examples of Mark getting caught stealing. Jonathan even said that when he was angry, Mark would prowl around the Mennonite community to see what he could find. Negative After Grinch. speaking with Jonathan's son, Detective Nagel learned that Mark had allegedly robbed the Martins' family store. However, charges were never pressed due to the fact that the store security camera had its memory card stolen. So there was never visual the proof goot. of Mark being the one who robbed the store. <laughs> 
While there may not have been any evidence of Mark's involvement at the time of the robbery, Detective Nagel was able to actually find the security footage from that robbery on Mark's own phone. And it showed a man with Mark's height and build robbing the store. In one of the photos, a car that looked suspiciously like Mark's could be seen in the background. With these photos, Detective Nagel had what appeared to be tangible proof that these accusations against Mark weren't just hearsay. Fucking thug. Eventually, the detective got a hold of Jared Ulrich, a man who claimed to be Mark's partner in crime in the past. Jared openly confessed to Detective Nagel about all the robberies he'd allegedly committed with Mark, and he described in detail how Mark would try to frame other people in the community for their crimes. There definitely seemed to be evidence that Jared may have been telling the truth, as a series of texts were found on Mark's phone, all of which had been recently deleted. In these texts, Mark talked to Sam about Jared never understanding the real cost of getting caught. Mark then asked Sam to remotely wipe Jared's phone, something that he also asked Sam to do to his own phone after he fell under suspicion for Sasha's murder. While all of this information against Mark was damning enough, there was still one more disturbing truth to learn. Through many more interviews, Detective Nagel was eventually put in contact with Andrew and Galen Headings, a pair of brothers who were close with Mark during his time in Wisconsin. Andrew recounted a time where he had confronted Mark for stealing, and during their conversation, Mark was so cold and bitter that Andrew said he feared for his life. Galen had an even more disturbing revelation for Detective Galen. Nagel as he told her about Mark's alleged inappropriate actions towards women. According to Galen, Mark confessed to him that he had allegedly assaulted a young girl his sister was babysitting when he was around 10 to 13 years old. However, this claim has never been publicly proven, and there's no evidence of it being true. Still, with this information, it became clear that Mark always had the capacity to harm others, and allegedly had many times in the past. Mark's motive in harming Sasha was also more evident than ever. Mm. All the unfounded anger and resentment he had towards the Mennonite community had been steadily growing over the years, and as it did... Mark took his revenge against them further and further. Up to this point, charges had never been pressed against Mark, and he felt like he could outsmart anyone, even the police. With this misplaced confidence, Mark decided to see if he could get away with the ultimate crime, murder. It appears that Mark had gone to the Mennonite community that day in search of a victim, and tragically, Sasha was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mark grabbed her from her car late at night and no one saw a thing. Still, that didn't prevent him from getting caught. Unfortunately for him, while no one had previously pressed any charges for his theft, the state of Arizona was more than happy to charge Mark for Sasha's murder and put him on trial. Mark's trial began on September 24th, 2021. In January of 2022, the jury found Mark guilty on charges of kidnapping and first-degree murder earning him a life sentence. For his help in covering up Mark's crimes, Sam Gooch pleaded guilty and received three years probation. With both Sam and Mark dealt with, Sasha Krause and her family finally received the justice they deserve.